Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about news, views, trends and opinions, normally from a conservative perspective, but this evening we'll be talking about it from a libertarian perspective as well, but you'll see there's some overlap. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening we're joined by Mark Hinkle. He's been involved with the Libertarian Party for decades, from the local level through the national level. Mark, welcome to the show. Chris, delighted to be here. Thanks for joining us. And we want to learn a little bit more about how someone discovers their inner libertarian. Well, I can tell you how I became a libertarian. Um, when I was 17 years old, my parents took my sister and I on an uh, extended trip to Europe. And my mother figured I should have something to read in the uh, evenings uh, because uh, TV in, in uh, Europe is typically in the local language, of course, and I'm uh, monolingual. And so she brought along a copy of Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, and uh, that kept me busy usually till about 2 o'clock in the morning. So an 1,800-page book on libertarian ideas for a 17-year-old man in a socialist environment. It pretty much sums it up, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and what interested a 17-year-old man in reading such a lengthy book till 2 in the morning? Well, once you get past the first 100 pages, for anybody who's read Alice Shrugged, I think everybody will agree, the first 100 pages is a little tough getting over. But once you get into it, uh, in addition to the philosophy, which rang true to me, uh, it's a great story. Uh, so great a story that they've actually made it into three movies. So uh, it's a good story with good philosophy. And uh, I think uh, that kept my uh, interest until I was literally well, willing to fall asleep late at night. <laughs> Well, what's interesting is that even though we were talking before the show that it was copyrighted somewhere around 1957, a lot of the philosophies that were kind of predicted of what happens when power is allowed to run within crony circles, etc., has been manifesting itself for quite a while here in the States. Well, you know, all the old uh, philosophy or, or saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely uh, certainly has held true throughout history, and we're no different. Uh, we're, we're creatures of habit, and uh, people who seek power will pretty much do anything to uh, seek that power. And uh, that's one of the reasons why the Libertarian Party exists, is to put a quash on that overreaching power. And we believe in a voluntary society, and whenever politicians or anybody else tries to step over that uh, boundary, that, that's when the Libertarian says, hold it, hold it right there. Right. So talk to us a little bit. That's about how you maybe absorbed some of the philosophy and your background and, and your parents probably had some influence on your tending libertarian as well. But there's a difference between identifying with libertarian philosophy and actually doing something normal libertarians don't do, and that's get involved in trying to change <laughs> things. They would rather be left alone. What would possess a person of libertarian leaning? to get in there, mix it up, and not just do it on a small basis, but go across the country trying to <laughs> spread the word. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, early on, that was one of the decisions I had to make. Do I, uh, like a lot of libertarians, uh, just you know find a place up in the hills and uh, sequester food and guns and ammo and all that sort of stuff? Or do I uh, actively get involved in trying to stop the, uh, the, the march towards socialism and totalitarianism? And it was a difficult decision, but ultimately I looked at some of our founding fathers and they gave me some inspiration. You know, they overcome incredible odds to found this nation, uh, this grand uh, experiment. And uh, so ultimately I decided, okay, uh, let's give it one last shot to try to save this nation before it goes into the deep end of socialism and totalitarianism. And what's interesting, just thinking about where we are as a society, you put rustic pictures in my mind of someone out in the woods, in nature, or something like that, with some food store, but since they have firearms, they don't have to store as much food because they can go harvest their own. Right. And in today's day and age, not only are people happy to have the government involved, they laugh at you for doing things like storing food or having firearms or being able to compete for yourself out in the world for, for your survival. Do you ever feel like you're trapped in a time warp, <laughs> uh, especially in California? Yeah. where? 
Well, you know, we're in an a, a, a economy that really does reward you for being interdependent with other folks, and I certainly don't want to discourage people from specializing. Uh, certainly here in Silicon Valley, uh, specialization has led to incredible riches. Uh, but on a personal level, uh, I think it's responsible of each individual to take care of themselves and their family by taking care of things. And again, I don't st store great uh, sums of uh, you know gold and food and ammo and stuff like that. But I've got you know some uh, just on the off chance that things do dar start to go south uh, very rapidly. Um, but I'm pretty much committed to trying to restore freedom in the United States and. Uh, you know, I think there'll be some warning signals if things really start to take a, a dark turn. Right. Uh, but right now, I'm very confident that we're going to uh, turn things around. And one of the reasons why I'm very confident, particularly here in California, I look at the people who are registered to vote, and you may not be familiar with this, but for example, liberal, uh, democratic controlled, uber liberal San Francisco, 30% of the voters are registered with no political party. Right. That's huge. People are voting by saying, look, I've had it with the Republican Democratic establishment. We're looking for something new. Uh, I think something like 75% of the voters have indicated they, there is a need for a third uh, political party. And hopefully the Libertarian Party is that political party. But, you know, in competition with the Republicans, Democrats, Hopefully the best party wins, and we hope we're, we're us. <laughs> well, in California, we're just hoping for a second party to emerge, <laughs> let alone a third. But I agree with you that a lot of people identify with libertarianism, and it, it seems like the most easily accessible choice for a third party, a viable third party in California, because in, Calif in Alameda County, I know as an example, there are something like 90 parties that are counted, but only six are official. Right. Uh, but libertarianism tends to, aspects of it tend to resonate on the progressive side, when you're looking at the social aspects of Correct. leave me the heck alone, and on the conservative side from the government perspective of leave me the heck alone. Talk to us about what you're seeing out there. I know the Libertarian Party is notorious for taking tests on street corners <laughs> and showing people that they're actually more libertarian than they expected. What's been your experience with that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, whether it's in high schools or uh, the, uh, the Junior States of America uh, conventions or street corner um, gun shows, uh, art and wine festivals, we do all of those. And what's, this is called the world's smallest political quiz. And basically we ask five or 10 questions on civil liberties issues and economic issues. And we actually chart people where they fit, whether they're centrist, totalitarian, left-wing, right-wing. And uh, it's very interesting. Uh, younger uh, people typically be, are usually a little more authoritarian, um, but there are certain issues like the drug issue where they tend to be more civilitarian oriented. And then as they grow older and join the workforce, then sort of the economics <laughs> just sort of start kicking. It's like, you wait a minute, I'm paying how much of my salary for income taxes and state income taxes and Social Security, and Medicaid, and da 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 da. And then you know the little economic reality comes in, and that's where they blend together, and the civil liberties side and the economic side comes together, and more and more people start floating up to the libertarian quadrant. Right. And so there are a few core components of the libertarian platform that get a lot of notoriety. <laughs> uh, the, the issue of legalization of drugs, there's the gun aspect. Tell us about the top three or four that the libertarian party may want to be identified with, okay. whether it's those or others. Well, one of the key issues that's going to be on the ballot in 2016 here in California is the legalization of marijuana. And I'm one of those folks that hate marijuana. I can't stand the smell of it. I've never used it. But I want to legalize it, or actually what I like to say is re-legalize it, to point out that we, marijuana was once a legal drug and it was very little problem. Uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to say drugs, if they're legal, are going to totally eliminate all problems, because that's not the case. But it's going to be dramatically better than in the situation is now. 
and this is not just a theoretical uh, um, idea on my part, uh, Portugal in 2001 essentially re-legalized all drugs. I'm talking not just heroin, but cocaine, meth, you name it, all drugs. It's treated as a medical issue and a social issue rather than a criminal issue. Guess which country in the EU has the lowest recreational drug use? Portugal, is that the answer? Chris, you're such a smart guy. So from a conservative standpoint, if you want to minimize the negative aspects of the drug usage, which I certainly do, you want to really license them. That's, that's the solution. Because what happens when you make something illegal, you create a black market because the demand does not go away just because you made something illegal. Uh, one of the things that somebody says, you know, well, of course, all we have to do is outlaw guns and they'll disappear because that's what happened when we outlawed drugs, right? Of course not. So the unintended consequences of the drug war is we have per capita more people behind bars than any other nation on earth. And the cost to keep people behind bars, typically the equivalent or better than a college education at Santa Clara University, Stanford University, UC Berkeley. So we're wasting an incredible amount of money to keep people from using drugs that if they use by themselves and at their home and they're not endangering anybody else, why should anybody care? Why should the government care? Well, it's interesting. Whenever government declares war on anything, we seem to get more of it. War <laughs> exactly. on poverty, war on drugs. You know, you bring up a good point. Uh, the war on poverty was officially announced during LBJ's administration. And if you look at the chart of the per capita poverty weight, it was on a steady decline until the war on poverty was declared, and then it flattened out. And Part of the reason for that is any time the government tries to solve a problem, if they create a department of the government to solve a problem, what's job one of every bureaucracy? To stay in business. Exactly. So you have no incentive to solve the problem for which you were created. Another example I love to use is in the Carter administration, they created the Department of Energy. Do you remember what the, uh, the, 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 the mechanism and uh, the goal of the Department of Energy? They were into energy independence? Would that exactly be Exactly kind of right. And we're still talking about it and not achieving it. <laughs> exactly. And now we have become a little less energy independent, but the government, of course, had nothing to do with that. That had to do with the oil fields up in North Dakota. And, of course, the pipeline is actually being thwarted by the government that would actually uh, decrease our dependence on foreign oil. So there you go. Well, but then you end up with a lower tax base because things are less expensive and more available and the government doesn't want a lower tax base. To well, and, and that's a very good point. Anytime the price of gasoline shoots up dramatically, people call on the government to do something. Well, if you are taxing, uh, putting the sales tax on a gallon of gasoline and the gallon of gasoline cost goes up, that means more money in the government coffers. They have no incentive to do anything about dropping prices. Boy. And of course, we have record high sales tax and record high uh, excise taxes, both from the state and federal level on gasoline. We actually pay more tax than I believe every other uh, state in the nation here in California. A good friend of mine works in Oklahoma City, a dollar a gallon less than what we're paying. Yeah, but it's the big oil companies that we really want to target versus I think that we should actually have a disclaimer of how much tax goes into each gallon and where it goes. I think people might have a slightly different philosophy on. Well, and here's another good question. <clears throat> do businesses and corporations really pay taxes or do they just pass that cost on to the consumer? My theory is they either pass the cost on the consumer, which is the more likely event, or it's reduced benefits to their employees or reduced uh, price of the stock. But guess what? The corporation don't pay taxes. Businesses don't pay tax. It's a hidden tax on the consumer. So when you hear politicians talk about businesses ought to pay their fair share, what they're really saying is, I'm gonna, Chris, I'm gonna stick you with another tax.
And it goes beyond that with governments getting involved. This this weekend on Facebook, I saw someone crying because the prices at Chipotle in San Francisco have gone up since they hiked the minimum wage to fifteen dollars. Hmm, and how did that so, happen? across the nation, Chipotle raised their rates about four percent to keep up with the cost of beef or what have you, and miraculously, about fifteen percent in San Francisco. I voiced this opinion in the house that I wonder why these people are crying. My 13-year-old daughter turns to me and said, what did they expect was going to happen? That's basic economics. But evidently, politicians don't learn basic <laughs> economics. No, they don't. Well, and, and the bad thing is, you know, if, if you're a captive market in San Francisco, you can set the rates pretty much anywhere you want. But we're not in a captive market. We're actually in a worldwide global economy. So if the if I'm, I'm a small businessman, if I'm competing against another business in Nevada and their tax rate is half what it is for me, guess what? They have a competitive advantage. Maybe it behooves me to actually move my business across the border in Nevada or in Texas, which literally tens of thousands of people have moved their businesses to Texas because lower taxes. Uh, literally, if you want to start up a corporation in Texas, takes you $25 and about three days time frame. Here in California, about 288 days to open up a new uh, chain. Like uh, I recently attended uh, Freedom Fest in Las Vegas and the head of, I think it was Arby's came by and talked about opening up an Arby's in Los Angeles, 288 days versus something like 30 or 40 days in some other states. Carl's Jr did the same thing and said they're not opening any more restaurants in California. Love the state, can't handle it, off they go. My insurance company is no longer writing new policies in California because they can't afford to do business here. And of course, I and you were paying inflated rates because of that. Right. So we talked a little bit about drugs and legalization. We talked, you've interspersed taxes throughout you guys are known for guns also. <laughs> Talk to us about the, the perspective on should there be more guns, less guns, or at least the ability to access them? Well, I strongly people recommend, and there's a book out there called More Guns, Less Crime. And it's written by Professor John Lott. And the interesting thing about that book is he actually set out to prove more guns means more crime. But he actually went through the uh, FBI statistics and found out just the opposite. When people are allowed to defend themselves, carry concealed weapons uh, in states that have shell issue permits, they have a lower crime rate. Uh, Kennesaw, Georgia was one of the first cities that took the sort of extreme measure, and this is something libertarians don't endorse, but they took the extreme measure of requiring every household to have a firearm. Now again, I don't want to force you to carry a firearm if you're uncomfortable doing that. And libertarians certainly would not do this. But an interesting thing happened after this obviously was a very well publicized uh, ordinance that passed in Kennesaw, Georgia. Guess what happened to the burglaries, the assaults, the rapes? Near zero? <laughs> they dropped like 80 to 90 percent. Right. Because if you're a thief, do you really want to go into a household where somebody might be shooting back at you? No, there's better pickings in gun-free zones. And of course, that's where they go. Yeah, absolutely, because if you're not going to be stopped, it's easier to take out eight or 10 or 30 people if nobody's shooting back. If somebody's shooting back, you might get one or two, but the numbers go way down. Yeah, exactly. Now, libertarians are not big on banning things, but one thing we would like to ban is gun-free zones, because again, you look at virtually all the mass shootings, virtually all of them happen in gun-free zones. In uh, Aurora, <clears throat> Colorado, there were six theaters, one of which had a gun-free zone. Where do you think the gunman went? The gun-free zone. Bingo. No competition. Bingo. So, guns, drugs, <laughs> taxes, what else do you guys <laughs> want to see changing the, uh, on, on the political landscape? Well, clearly, uh, worldwide... Clearly worldwide, we have a what I would call a department of offense instead of a department of defense. Uh, I believe we have soldiers in something like 125 countries around the world. Uh, our founding fathers created the uh, Department of War, which later was changed to the Department of Defense. 
and we want our soldiers to come back and defend the United States. Because I think if you look at the history of our involvement in the Middle East, and not just the United States, but you know, the, a lot of countries in Europe uh, literally have been messing around with uh, Egypt and Syria and Iran. I mean, we had in Iran, the duly elected, democratically elected president was deposed by the United States. And who do we put in? The Shah of Iran, a dictator. Now, I thought we were supposed to be a republic and we believed in free elections, and yet here we were putting in a despot who fortunately was then thrown out later. But if we had a foreign power come in and install a dictator in the United States, how do you think we would react toward that foreign power? Probably hate their guts, right? Right. Maybe we'd even go so far as to commit terrorist acts against that government. As things happen. Things happen. <laughs> exactly right. So we believe in a non-intervention as foreign policy. Now, again, there are bad things that are going on overseas. And as individuals, if you want to help out starving people or hurricane victims or tsunami victims or war-torn victims, we think you should have the power and the right to do that. My understanding is we actually have laws that prohibit you to get involved in foreign conflicts we think those laws should be going away. And if you want to help one side or the other in some foreign conflict, you want to risk your life to help save others, that's your business. Okay. So we've just got a couple of minutes left, and I was going to give you a test on the litmus test <laughs> for which is the most libertarian and the least libertarian uh, presidential candidate that's announced so far. Do you have any opinions on that? Well, probably the most libertarian, I would say, is Rand Paul. I mean, I think uh, son of uh, Ron Paul. Uh, Ron Paul was one of our presidential candidates a few years ago. Uh, had a, the opportunity to meet Ron Paul several times, uh, and Rand Paul a couple of times. Uh, Rand Paul, I think, is somewhat of a Ron Paul light in, in the, from a libertarian perspective. And, but he's definitely the front runner as far as uh, the libertarian candidate for office. My feeling is, and my thoughts are, that there are two main reasons why I don't think Ron Paul, or Rand Paul is going to be the presidential candidate for the Republican Party and won't be the presidential, uh, uh, won't be the president. Uh, number one is the Democratic Party, and number two is the Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> They'll team up if they think there's a threat. Exactly to act. right. People actually getting that libertarian streak satisfied? Craziness. Yeah. Uh, we've only got a, a very short amount of time left. Who's the least libertarian, as you can tell? Uh, probably Donald Trump. I uh, had the opportunity of missing his speech at Freedom <laughs> Fest. Uh, that guy is <clears throat> a piece of work. And uh, um, our chair, uh, Nick Sarwak of the Libertarian Party, actually was in line to ask him about his use of eminent domain, which libertarians are very much opposed to. He literally tried to use eminent domain to steal a house from a, a widow so he could build a garage for limousines. I'm sorry, that's above the pale. <laughs> okay, so um, just in closing, if people want to find more about the Libertarian Party or the things that you're up to, do you have a website or where would you like them to go? Very simple website, uh, lp.org, stands for libertarianparty.org. And so if they can't spend, spell LP, they're not allowed to look at the site, right? <laughs> no, they're allowed to look. We, we believe in uh, you know, freedom of speech. Okay. And freedom of sight. Freedom of sight. And freedom go. of movement. <laughs> Pretty much freedom of everything. Well, Mark, thanks for joining us. If you'll hold on for just a moment, we'll be back after a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. The Conservative Forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show, The Right Side, covering today's topics. 
Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. And that was a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. We appreciate the fact that they've kept us on the air for nearly four years now, but we're actually not the program that they're best known for. In fact, what they're best known for is their speaker series, which tends to meet the second Tuesday of each month at the IFES Portuguese Hall at 432 Stirling Road here in Mountain View, about three minutes from the studio. In August, the speaker will be Gert Wilders, Dutch politician and the founder and leader of the Party for Freedom in the Netherlands. In September, Charlie Kirk, a 21-year-old founder and executive director of Turning Point USA. In October, David Spady, California State Director for Americans for Prosperity. And in November, Kurt Schlichter, Army Colonel, trial lawyer, and national commentator for Fox News, Dennis Miller, Hugh Hewitt, and others. If you'd like more information on the programs at the forum, you can go to theconservativeforum.com for more details. In closing tonight, it's been very interesting to me over the last several years that I've been involved in the political landscape in, here in California that really libertarianism is more appealing uh, to many people than might realize it at first. As we stated during the show, sometimes there's the aspects of the more uh, hands-off approach to foreign policy or the legalization of recreational drugs or medicinal purposed uh, implements, if you will. On the other side, people like the smaller government, freedom to, to defend their families, and a lot of people really do converge in that libertarian part of the spectrum if they investigate more deeply and, and get an understanding because I think ultimately American DNA says, leave us the heck alone. Let us live our lives. Let us chase the freedom that and the definition of prosperity that we each prefer. If you want more information on the things that Mark was talking about, again, you can visit lp.org and learn more. I've been your host, Chris Pereja. This has been The Right Side, and we're hoping to see you again either in person or on the show sometime soon. But if you just can't wait, you can find us at therightsidetv at gmail.com, and we'll try to get responses to your questions back at you as soon as possible. Thanks again, and have a great night.